Got it. Look at that. Look at that. Um, actually, we're not going to do that right now. Sorry. I lied. Um, we are going to, we're going to start today by talking about who we're talking about today. Um, actually, you guys should all be very excited. Today's class was a suggestion from Audrey, which is one of her favorite abstract um, artists. And I sent a list to Leah. And so we are kind of entering into a three class um, kind of series on abstract collage. And so it's gonna be, they're all three very different types of abstract collage artists. Um, so we're gonna kind of get different skills and different um, insights from each of them. But we're gonna start with one who is a lot more pop culture um, she was born in 1940. Her name is Elizabeth Murray. And she um, was super inspired by like cubist stuff, you know, and that whole cubist minimalism and surrealist influence stuff. So her, um, her style of artwork starts with sketches and then she creates huge canvas based sculptures that hang on the wall. And um, they're very interesting. Um, She's really charming. She died in 2007, um, which isn't that long ago when you think about it, which makes her kind of more of a contemporary artist. And um, she talks about, she talk, talks a lot about how the School of Art uh, Institute in Chicago really helped her learn how to be a person and that going to art school allowed her to, um, you know, start to really stand strong in herself and she makes jokes that like really like in art school all the teachers were trying to teach them basically that you can't do art for a living um but that what she was really learning from art school was like how to wear big boots and blue eyeshadow and be and speak in confidence for themselves and for the first time in her life she felt like she could really just state her opinion so as is par for course i have a four minute video for us um I want to share with you guys Art 21. If you've never gone to art school, then you probably haven't been forced to watch Art 21. Um, <laughs> am I wrong? Nope. So Art 21 used to, 100% of them used to be available on YouTube. You can just Google Art 21. They're amazing. They're short four minutes to 15 minutes to 50 minute um, uh, sessions on different artists all around the world. Um, and they're really beautifully done. So we're going to watch Elizabeth Murray, one of her art, art 51s, I or art 21s. I chose not to um, chose not to make you guys watch the really long one. <laughs> so we're going to watch the four minute one. <laughs> and then we're going to work on some exercises that I've developed based off of. Yeah, we would have been best friends with her. I keep looking at it. I'll have to go back and start working again. <laughs> I'm looking for is resolution. I have it one day and I don't have it the next day. But that's why being an artist is so great because you can get that kind of satisfaction. And the thing that's been hard about these paintings is that I don't know how I'm gonna get them resolved. You're right, I love her already. <laughs> I thought you should when watch I did the, the drawings one. for this painting, I was very excited. It, they looked really great to me and then I blew it up and the guys who make these forms for me put it together, made it, came back into the studio. Um, and, you know, the minute I saw it, I just didn't see how it was going to go together at all, even before I touched it. Just the way the forms were working, I just, what was I thinking of? This is going to be horrible. And it was really, really a long journey with this painting. The colors I thought I was going to use, none of them worked in the beginning. Um, but that's nothing new. Now, the whole painting was painful. Usually, 
what happens is when I start to really hate it, it starts to go someplace. But it's almost as though you have to like get down mm -hmm. into that place where you absolutely hate you, it girl. and want to rip it off the wall and rip Burn it, it to down. pieces and throw it out <laughs> to um, to start getting into it. It's very strange. For instance, that particular bloopy shape with the spinal column that goes through it. I wanted something through the center. I needed something in the middle in, that was going kind of off center in the form. And I had a zigzaggy line for a while. And for a while I liked it. And then one day I came in here and I said, no. The spinal column ended up being a kind of way to get through the shape and into the next shape. The resolution has to happen without anybody seeing it, not even me. But I know that it's there. I feel that it's there. There's a moment where I start to feel it with this painting. And I don't think I could describe it, but I do feel, I feel that with it because I can stop it. When I look at it, instead of like it being this battle, this conflict that I have to try to pull together, it, I can look at it peacefully. Do you remember the box? Come on, Steve. You're the block man. No, I'm not a chicken yet. <laughs> When it feels right, it's such a, a natural thing when it feels right, when you realize that something really is completed. So, let me... Wow. <laughs> She's awesome. She is adorable. Um, I'm going to show you some more images of her work so that you guys can get a better perspective on really kind of um, how how her large sculptures come into play. You know, you can see them all, right? They're all very cartoony. And really, all of these started as drawings that she then um, turns into these like large canvas sculptures. Like she said, she has somebody that makes the canvas for her, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is that one right here, Bop, is the one that we were looking at. Um, and they're all different and unique in their own ways. And look at them in the actual like gallery. Look how beautiful they are. Um, abstract art doesn't necessarily mean that it's just paint smudges and, and things like that. Really, it's like the, the process of abstracting representational things. And for some people, that's paint smudges and drips and things like that. And for some people like her, it's these kind of pop art, uh, kind of almost balloon figures. What they do remind me of, and I think that um, is why I enjoy her work so much, is they remind me of when you're in high school and the doodles that you do in your, your various notebooks and how we, um, you know, the ways that we kind of draw our life at that time. So my thought on it was um, that I thought maybe how we would start this and maybe our best way to explore some of the interesting ways that um, she expresses herself is, is we're going to start with, we're going to use some really basic supplies today. Um, I, I'm trying to keep it to basic supplies in general right now, um, but we're going to, I'm going to use my watercolor, uh, pencils. I'm going to use my water soluble oil pastels and a pencil for the first major part of this. Um, I might use paint for the second part. What we're going to do is, is I'm going to suggest a representational item. And then I want you guys to start with colored pencils and pencils and try and deconstruct it in the style that Elizabeth Murray works in. So I want you to take these items and I've chosen things that I think are fun, that have lots of um, components that can be pulled out and reorganized into different ways. And then I want you to take that 
when you find your conglomeration of shapes that you love, I want you then to use your colored pencils or oil pastels or crayons to color them in and explore it. Um, what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna do this with, I have three different items that we're gonna do this with. We're probably gonna do it for say 30 minutes a piece, you know? And then maybe what we'll do is you'll choose the one you like. And then what I want you to do is paint it I want you to cut it out and collage it so that you can actually kind of experience the way that one, one of the things that she does is exceptional is the way that she layers her paint. You can see that she creates depth in doing that and in the ways that she rearranges her subject um, as she sees fit. But the reality is, is that we're gonna focus first on these uh, this the whole process of teaching our brain to deconstruct something that we already know what it looks like into something new. So for the first object that I chose, I chose a house, okay? I wanna remind you some of the things that are helpful during this is remember that your door doesn't have to be in the front of your house, right? Your doorknob doesn't have to be in the front of your house. The clouds that would be around your house don't have to be on top of the house. They could be below the house. They could be inside of the house. I want you to use the idea of a house because it has a lot of preconceived geometric shapes that we can work with. And I want you to figure out different ways that you're gonna deconstruct the shape. And as you find a little storytelling blob that you like is what I I'm gonna call them. I want you then to start experimenting with colors and figure out when you have already chosen the geometric shapes, what do the colors, what story do the colors have to say? Does that make sense for everybody? It's really big and scary, right? Okay, so we're gonna start. Um, and I've been thinking about this a lot, obviously. I chose a couple of things that are inspired by uh, my current, like my life. Right now, um, we just found out that our landlord is gonna sell our brand new rental and that we are likely to be out of a home soon. Oh, I live no. in an area that I previously mentioned has absolutely no rentals. There are zero rentals on the market right now. Um, so it's a very trying time. Uh, so I guess that's probably why I chose a house, but it's also because it's a really easy thing. I have three different pencils. I have a, a professional drawing pencil. I have a mechanical pencil and then I have my trusty Tycan Droga, which is my favorite. And I'm probably gonna use that one first. Um, and then I'm probably just gonna start figuring out how I wanna do the shapes. I know for myself that in general, I tend to have to redraw shapes repeatedly until I find the version of the shape that I like, you know? Um, that's just kind of who I am, but we'll see, you never know. And then I'll probably make my door really actually out here. Something that I'm thinking about just to kind of talk about what I'm thinking about when I'm deconstructing this house is that one of the things I really like about Elizabeth Murray's work is, is that she uses a lot of rounded objects. So I want to not focus too much on just removing the house square from the triangle square from the square of the windows from, the, you know, like I want to consider how I might pull in some round objects that would be on a house as well. Does that make sense? Awesome, everyone. Here we go. This kind of um, art has a couple of things that are really important about it. When you get down to just what, you know, really stems from doodling is remember that, I'm sure that Leah has talked about this in all of her other classes, but the, the weight of your line and becomes really important as a stylistic choice. One of the things that Lisa, that people really like about Lisa Congdon's work is that she is very specific about how she does the weight of her lines. You have an opportunity here because of the way that these shapes will originate to have thicker lines that are more expressive, you know, and things like that. Yes, although I've never put it as well as you had just put it right there. So thanks. Weight of the line. <laughs> well, I mean, that's how it settles in my brain. And maybe that's because I mean, I, I want to be a better drawer and Audrey can attest that I'm taking an online architectural drawing class and I'm working on it. I also happen to be reading Lisa Congdon's most recent creativity book. 
just because I think it's really important to stay up to date on that kind of stuff. Um, and it's very interesting because it's about style. I don't feel like I need Lisa Congdon to help me find my style, but I do appreciate the book, right? I so. think you have a very specific way of what of with your lines that is uh, that I'm becoming like very familiar with because now I get to watch you make stuff. And I think if everything you do, it's very distinctly yours. It's so funny because, you know, as I'm doing this architectural drawing course and it's, I'm doing it through Domestica, which is just a, like an online teaching platform. Mm -hmm. um, I start by drawing the buildings because that's what we're drawing in architecture, right? right? And the perspective that the teacher asks. And then I do a second drawing that's a little less the teacher's perspective. And then I do a third drawing that is in my messy line style. Yeah. And I'm trying to learn the kind of the better techniques about re representation and perspective than, and then still having them in my style. Because what I realize is I'm not always a big fan of actually clean drawings. Um, I kind of like messy drawings. I like drawings that don't necessarily make sense. You like, um, you also have very strong lines in your work. There are definite. Yeah. Uh, there's a cleanness to the lines in your mark making. Yeah. That I think is very, which I really appreciate. Um, and I, and like I said, the more that now I get to watch you do it, I can really see it. Consistently. Same with you and Jean, it's the same with you and uh, Mina. I mean, I've been able to watch you guys, but you know, Chris is a pro. So it's fun to see like a, like how a pro constructs their work. You guys are still figuring out what it is that you do naturally. Um, but you know, when you do this for a living, you kind of, it's there and- okay. I work on it every day as part of it too. Yeah. And I feel like this exercise, hold on, one of my cameras, oh, okay. Uh, I feel like this exercise is great because she does a lot of just, you know, uh, colored pencil drawings of different versions of this stuff. And um, it allows you to kind of re rethink your perspective a little bit. I used to really hate my own mark making, but, and it's got a very distinct skill of its own, but I find that like when I'm in a crunch situation, if I can allow myself to think, uh, I really literally have to think this in my head. You make choppy marks, just make your choppy marks, make your choppy marks, make your choppy marks, grab your brush, it helps you make it. And then I'm like, I can get through it. Well, because the better quality work is gonna come from the most authentic presentation. Right, like, but you can, one can sort of talk yourself out of it, right? Like you can- Oh, I, as an artist, I experiment with a lot of mediums and a lot of styles and a lot of techniques a lot. And that's just been who I am because ultimately what I am is a visual storyteller. And I wanna be able to tell stories however my brain imagines them. But I was doing this submission because lately I've been doing I'm doing a lot of other collaborative projects, which are very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, like I'm gonna do a, a project with a dance company and I am applying for this call for art for an organization. It's like the perfect call for me. So I'm putting my, you know, my submission package together today and it's work from the last, I don't know, 2018 till now, last three years of my life. And it's so funny because I'm looking at the work and I'm like, oh, this is perfect. This is a really good work for this. And then I'm like, sorry. Um, and I'm like, you know, this is perfect style of work for me. And then um, <laughs> I, I doubt myself. I say, can I create work that's that beautiful now, you know? I'm creating this submission. And if they say yes to this commission, can I do it? So I guess I'll be like, Leah, remember, you can do this. You just got to create translucent, no opaque layers. Yeah, yeah. Just say the thing that you do over and over again. Just say, that's what I do. I'm imagining, have you ever watched the show, uh, Greatest Portrait Artist of the Year? Mm -mm. The word, or is that what it is called, Jean? Yeah, Portrait, Portrait Artist of the Year. It's a British show. They get both amateurs and professional artists to paint 
a celebrity, kind of like a cooking show. Okay. Um, they all have very distinct styles and they all have to do it on TV live, right? And then somebody gets chosen to like, anyway, like I can imagine this is how they must all feel. Like they must at some point just be like, okay, just shut it down. Just do the right. thing on the plastic like you always do or make the marks. I just think at some point you got to just like. It's uh, funny because, you know, I do, like I said, I do performances and it's funny how you have to hyper focus. Yeah. Uh, we have that artist in that also does performances and he's done performances. I mean, as long as I've known him, he did performances for me when we lived in St. John's. And um, we were talking just about how exhausting it is. It's a completely different kind of exhausting yeah. than yeah. just painting in your studio. Part of it is, is you have to hyper-focus. You have to ignore the people around you so that you can focus on your task at hand. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, it is. It is big. Just, <laughs> just, just remember. <laughs> do what you know how to do. Do what you do. Do what you do. Do what you do. <laughs> Try to do what anybody else is doing. I will tell you so. Christine. Yeah. Are you doing three different houses, or are you so doing like, so like, three a, like topics? I'm, it's the same. They're all houses. They're all shapes that I'm settling from. But remember, the house isn't just the house. Some of it's like I was imagining clouds. And that's why I kind of was working on the cloud up here was like the shape of a cloud. Because if we were drawing a house painting, we would probably include clouds. I included uh, the outline of a flower because any house I've ever had always has flowers outside of it. Um, and then I included raindrops because I'm from Oregon. Um, <laughs> And it rains here. Um, what I'm doing is, is I'm taking these different concepts and I'm rearranging them to find like the arrangement that I like the most. And so that's what's kind of nice about, I changed over, I realized I changed over to sketchbooking paper because this is painting paper, right? And it's a little easier. And of the compositions I've come up with so far, I think this composition up here is my favorite one and probably the one that I will put on the back of this paper and actually try and color then because that's the next step right now i'm just working on what are the shapes that i like what do i how do i like you know i like the tension be, by this like roof balancing off the edge of this square here i like the way that these big drops come into play this weird like if it had a chimney if the house had a chimney it might have smoke coming out of it it's kind of thinking of a fence up here like so i'm trying to reconfigure these items in a way that is more visually pleasing to me. And then I'm gonna start adding color to them and see where we go. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, How's it going for you two? And Nina, anything weird? We get very focused attention today. <laughs> uh, it's going, it's going. Mm -hmm. That's all I need to hear, it's going. I love and she was like, yeah, I'm like working on this shape. And then like, I'm working on the shape. And then I'm like, oh no, not that shape. Not that shape. <laughs> no. No. But and that's where shape to get to the shape that she wants to get to. Well, and here's the thing though, like here's where those kind of basic classes come into play a little bit. When we talk about some of the things that makes good abstract art, how those things can apply to all styles of abstract art. You know, tension is one of those things. Balance is one of those things. And not necessarily balance of the shapes on other shapes, but balance in the actual paper itself. One of the things that are really amazing about her work is if you saw she had really small shapes sometimes and really big shapes and like, she found a way to balance out the sizes of her shapes. And so I'm working a little bit on that. Like, I think this, like, I don't have enough small shapes in this one, which is why I think I tried something different here, but I really don't like the way that this came out. <laughs> so, you know, this is why I thought we'd kind of take half an hour per kind of idea is to really figure out. So you could do multiple if you want. You could draw on trash paper. You could fall in love with your first one. And if you do, good for you. So I interviewed uh, Omar today for Plytez for um, the article. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys, I didn't know anything about graffiti. Like he basically is completely self-taught. I have uh, no doubt. 
except for when, you know, he, there is a thing in graffiti artists, he's a, this is a, 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 an open studio artist who's a, a magnificent painter, like just epically. He reminds me of Kehinde Wally, although like different in his style, but like of that epic kind of nature. He likes to paint like sort of women and beautiful like positions. And Omar, he's from El Salvador originally. Um, but he started off as a graffiti artist in seventh grade. And he said all graffiti artists carried something they called a peace book around with them, like peace, like pieces of things. And that was your portfolio. So you did all your sketching in this little black book. And then you went around showing it to people. And um, that's how you got trained. And then sometimes you'd give your peace book to somebody else and they'd leave a drawing in it or you would do a collaborative drawing in the book. Huh. And that's how they learned from each other and that's how they collected each other's work. And then from the piece book, you went to spray paint. Interesting. I, mean, I had no idea. I'm like, you're kidding me. And then- I, One of our artists started by being a photographer of graffiti artists. So she would go out with them one at night in urban spots and photograph them. It is a really, there is a, 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 a there's a diligence to it that is uh, unrecognized, I think, in the art world. There's a real uh, pro learning process. The older mm -hmm. ones help the younger ones. Um, there's a competition, a lot of competition, right? Uh, both collectively and singularly. But your main thing is, you know, you want to paint a better painting than the group who painted the wall before you. So there's like continued like comp competition, but in this way that kind of like, um, just in a way that sort of pushes everybody to do their best. Um, it's <laughs> it was fascinating. I was like, and I was just right. thinking, Jeannie, I love your cat. I love that you want to put a cat in there. That gives me a great deal of joy. I well, really appreciate it. It's got to have a cat if it's a house. Right? <laughs> I mean, whose house doesn't have a cat? I love it. You know, that's, um, it's a very interesting subculture. I watched a documentary on it once that I felt like was really educational. Um, and I still don't pretend that I know what the heck is going on with it. And when I lived, grew up, the place that I grew up, Eugene, we had a graffiti park. So they built, I don't know, six or eight walls and they staggered them in the park and you were allowed to paint over the walls whenever you wanted to. But now I understand from what you just told me Leah, that there's probably kind of some rules as to which walls it would be appropriate for you to paint over if you have to be better than the previous piece, right? She's gone. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here. It's okay if you're not. <laughs> so I have uh, figured out kind of the shape, one that I'm going to start working with, and I'm going to send you guys a picture of it. It's kind of a, it's a conglomeration of all of them. So now, the hard part is going to be, now I'm going to start figuring out my colors. I'm probably going to have to redraw this a couple of times, I imagine, knowing myself. But, oh yeah, I like the bridge. The bridge is a great choice. Oh, and the plants, too. I'm into them all. So this is my, my final choice. So now I'm going to use my colored pencils to try and figure out the colors. And then I will put it on one of these and actually paint it. This is a pretty common kind of practice that allows you to save your expensive materials for last, right? Why make mistakes with the stuff that costs the most? But what I was going to say was, if you remember in that video, Elizabeth talked about needing something to go through the center of one of her shapes because she felt like it needed some kind of spine or something, right? And I'm looking at this square and I'm thinking, really like a lot of these other shapes that I've used here, but this square needs something. It takes up a lot of real estate on the page. 
And so I am imagining that when I decide to paint this, that I will need to figure out, you know, what kind of detail will go down through the center of my square to make it make sense to me. Does, does everybody understand what that means? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably some kind of path. It is actually, I'm kind of thinking about um, Nina's bridge. <laughs> <laughs> next, next, you should do a deconstructed cat, Jean. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see a deconstructed cat. <laughs> I looked at the cat. I was like, "There's a lot of good things." That was the cat was not on my list as I'm a dog owner. However, however, uh, you know my cats are great, so you know cats can be great. Well, and cats have lots of great shapes, and the, the items that I chose, I chose specifically because they had the capacity to be really interesting when deconstructed. Because I don't think, my brain doesn't think like this, you know? Yeah. <sighs> Kind of fun to force it though. That's Possibly, weird. it's possible only her brain really thinks like this. <laughs> but it's time to go down that rabbit hole. And... I gotta say though, I'm a cat owner, but uh, Carissa and Audrey have great dogs. We do have great dogs. Well, I, if I had a bigger place, I'd have a dog too. Yeah, I don't think you have to be one or the other. That's the best part, right? Jean, when you come to Portland, I'm gonna make sure to take you to Carissa and Audrey's studio. <gasps> yes, please. Where we're going into where the dogs currently reside. Where your yes, where your dogs are currently the kings. Yeah. Uh, and the queens uh but like i'll take you to visit them so you can see because it's in a beauty it's not too far from portland and i think it'll make a nice day trip you know uh kelly williams just stopped by with uh minnie nikki mickey or minnie geary no she brought minnie in before no she just came in with nikki uh the woman who she was teaching the class with last week nikki. oh nice How's she doing? Yeah, she's actually somebody I've known for a really long time and it online. So it's nice to meet her in person. Yeah. But it's always nice to have visitors like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm starting to like my shape formations. Now it's time to figure out the colors, which is kind of stressful. Uh, because you know how I feel about colors, but we'll see what we can do here, huh? It's 4.15, my dog is officially 
ready to get up for 45 minutes of begging before dinner. <laughs> and barking at the mailman. The mailman's already come and gone. She definitely is a little bit of a spitfire today. interesting when you ask people to deconstruct the house I realize like what kinds of uh, different things coming in, come into play for that for people right when we start to consider symbols of home what that what that really includes you know very interesting to me Yeah, that's not that's not the right color. I made my raindrops red thinking that I was just making them not raindroppy and now it just looks like blood. One of the reasons we work on sketchings, sketches and not just painting shit right off the bat. <laughs> Well, other than my red raindrops, I like a lot of the colors I've chosen. Um, we definitely won't do red raindrops in this final piece right here. But I do think that I'm going to use the blue. I like the way it's coming out. Now I've really went out and got real paint instead of my colored stuff. I'm going to start painting my house blobs. And we'll see how this is going to go. Okay. Fun. Huh? I'm enjoying watching this. It's fun. Silly. Good. That lady's got a great job. 
Although I will tell you, if you watch the elongated version, you see that her living space is connected to that giant ass studio. Freaking amazing. Mm -hmm. It's a incredibly perfect little like open floor plan, living room, kitchen, connected to a bedroom space. It's so beautiful. A little jealous. Maybe that's because I'm currently feeling being homeless, but or a little jealous. You have a beautiful studio space yourself. Oh, there's what I'm actually looking for. It was just too close to me. I didn't even know it. I like your <laughs> construction, Jean, of the that this fiery, fiery wall oh, windows. Yeah, it, it's, it's curtains. I like it. It feels the very frame it, and then the windows are on the outside of the curtain, and then the grass is on the top and the bottom. I feel very um, Salvador Dali with it. Yeah. <laughs> And then all these little things, the chair spinning through. I remember when I was first starting out as a reporter, we all, because we, none of us made any money. We all used to joke around that like, all we needed was one chair, a, di a, a bowl and a spoon. <laughs> and a cup that we could drink our coffee and our booze out of. And that's pretty much all we could afford, quite frankly. <laughs> and it's like, journalists didn't get paid very well. Isn't that sad, you know, compared to like the rolling culture? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and at the, that time, there was a lot of respect to be a journalist. I mean, not everybody liked you, but they, you were pretty necessary. It was and, respectful because we didn't have the internet, is what you're telling yeah, me? Yeah, that's how you got your information, you know, like mm -hmm. it was from the newspaper. Yeah, but there's also a lot of codes of ethics at that time that don't exist now, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm, just for some like technique tips, hot tips. What I'm, what I'm currently doing is I'm laying down my first layers of paint. And then after, you know, I finally settled truly on where all the color and stuff is going to go, I'm going to come in and kind of define the shapes, try to make them kind of sit out a little bit, almost have like a 3D component to them. Um, but I'll do that a little bit later.
Yeah, I definitely feel like I'm in high school again, writing like stoner S's and <laughs> I wish I wish sometimes that you guys could see what is happening around me as I'm teaching this class <laughs> because A, you would really be impressed with my superpowers to stay focused here considering that right now Audrey has tissue a thing and a wad of tissue hanging out of her nose as she is literally <laughs> still working. <laughs> oh, you're such a weirdo, Audrey. We love she's having really terrible allergies and she has to keep looking over at her mugs to get the handles on. So her fix is just to plug that shit up. <laughs> hey, you do what works, man. That is the truth. Oh my gosh, the pun that just was said. <laughs> Mugs can't handle themselves. <laughs> Potter joke. Potter joke, yeah. Somebody thinks they're funny. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I have a really fantastic picture of Audrey's mom and Rob that I accidentally took the other day. Oh my God, that's cute. I need to send it over to you. They're adorable. They really liked each other. They did. Mom's charmer. She sure is. And this is cute. It's I'm developing such a weird collection of random weird types of art that I never would have had before, but I'm into it. I think it'll all be used somehow, right? Potentially. Definitely got I've got some ideas in my mind. <laughs> Some notes on color choices as I went through several different iterations. One of the things that I personally focused on was choosing um, complementary colors. Because I feel like when you're making paintings that are full, full of big, bold statements like this, you know, big shapes like this, that you want to be extra aware of how colors work together. You know, because if you put you know, what are complementary colors? <laughs> I know Jean knows. Uh, okay, am I muted? No, no, you're not muted. Okay, you can hear me. Um, well, blue and orange. Uh huh. Red and green. Yeah. I have to look at my colors, but I don't know what other I colors. To, you know, um, one of my Red. favorite abstract artists has a watch face that is the color wheel. And I oh, think wow. brilliant. What's yellow, yellow and purple. Yes. And what does that mean, complementary colors? Opposite sides of the color wheel. Yeah, yeah. And what does that mean practically, from a practical standpoint? What does that mean the colors? They make they each other pop. Each if other. They come next to each other, they make each other pop. They emphasize each other. So in this particular situation, also what, I mean, gen in general, because you guys are smart individuals, you understand that it's not just blue and orange, right? It's shades of blue and shades of orange, right? As you change the hue of the color, it kind of changes the dynamics. What indigo blue, what indigo blue is going to sit next to versus what this cerulean blue is going to sit next to are two different stories. What I've chosen to do is I'm using orange and yellow because they both sit well with the cerulean blue. 
Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw in a surprise color. And that's where I come in from this like um, kind of rogue abstract artist perspective <laughs> is I believe that one of the, the most important parts of good abstract painting is having a little bit of surprise. So sometimes that's just a painting that's a whole bunch of one color that the surprise is that you throw in the complementary color, right? A bunch of different shades of blue and then you throw in a nice one top. This one, we'll see. I'm just testing them, Carissa, because that's the one thing I make them all learn. Oh, I think it's important. About color theory, you know, color understanding it, you know, it's hard when you consider like secondaries and tertiaries and you get into this whole kind of almost mathematical because that's really how the color wheel is working is it's mathematics, you know? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, when I was first starting and I was experimenting a lot, I kept not a piece book, which kind of is kind of what I was doing, but I, I kept like a little scrapbook book of all of my favorite color combinations. Oh, that's so great. And different parts, like I would sometimes take pictures of paintings and I was like, I like the way that this exact color of purple dots sits over top of this exact color of green. Because surprisingly, purple and green are soulmates. Awesome. This is um, this is becoming quite the fun little I have to say quite the fun little thing. Hey, snack, are you over there choking? I'm enjoying watching it happen. That's for sure. We can all thank Audrey for the awesome suggestion. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. Oh, there she is. Okay. Yeah, she's Sneaky, sneaky. We have a kitchen uh, bathroom in, a, in the hallway behind me. So you see people going back there. It's usually to use one of those. And there is the steps to our landlord's office, which is upstairs. Bastard. Not that one. No, no. no. Not bad, landlord. I take it back. I take it back. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice, landlord. But hey, you're not. Uh, this landlord actually is enraged at what's happening to us. Yeah. So, aren't, aren't there any laws that protect you? Because in Toronto, right, landlords are notorious for kicking yes, people out yes. to increase the rent. And so oh. the landlord tenant oh. board will have rights. Yes and no. So there are laws. Um, you have to be in a lease, and we are in what's called a month to month. Um, the reason for that is that our landlord, as it was explained to us, mind you, I'm going to also remind you that our landlord is the mother of our business partner in the gallery. Oh, great. Um, her reasoning for doing month to month, which is we're finding out and talking to a lot of people in Astoria is super common, was that she personally remodeled the duplex and she wanted to make sure, mind you, it's to full-size houses on top of each other. It's not really just a duplex. Um, she wanted to make sure that if somebody didn't want to live in it, that they weren't being forced to live in it because of a lease. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you can't destroy the house. Right. And at the time, it, you know, this is, this is part of a retirement package. This is, this is their income. They weren't going to get rid of it, you know, when, when they rented it to us. Um, and then what has happened is that the market has so drastically increased that they cannot resist the half a million dollars they're going to make off of it. Um, as for rules uh, protecting us, say the house sells to somebody who is going to what they call owner occupy it, meaning that the, they're going to move into it. We get 90 days after the sale of the home to find a new place to live. Uh, there is rent control in Oregon and kind of how that works is if the landlord keeps us, they can only raise our rent a certain percentage. 
at this point, I think it's about 11%. It's like a, it's 7% plus this weird index that exists. Um, it would be a $180 raise. We could afford that. Um, however, uh, our house is currently priced so far under market, it would take several yearly raises to get it back up, up to market rate. So since we're not on a lease, they can just cancel our month to month and we have to move out. That is so wrong. It's so fucking wrong. There is literally two houses for rent in the city of Astoria right now. Neither of them take animals. And us and our upstairs neighbors have to find a new place to live. Do they have to pay you any money to kick you out? Because Toronto's no. got things based on who owns it. Important, but not yeah? here. Important. Oh, no, because it, it, sorry, it depends if they're incorporated here. If they're incorporated as a corporation, then mm -hmm. they have different rules as opposed to owner occupier, then it's different. But if these guys are not owner occupier and it's under a corporation, they might have different rules. I don't know. No, they don't separate that here. However, what I can tell you is that one of the things that's kind of happening that coincides with this is that our county that we live in is in the process of reviewing the number of short-term uh, licenses that they give out. And what that means, why that matters to something like what we're going through is that because we live in a vacation spot, people make more money Airbnb or vacation renting out their home than renting or the property that they own than renting it to a long-term renter like say Audrey and I. Um, if they reduce the number of licenses that they allow, making it financially like not reasonable, the hope is that they can increase the, the rental um, inventory with long-term rentals. The concern here is, is that if our house sells, that the next person would just turn it into two Airbnbs instead of renting it to people like us. Right. Do they have to sell you with it? Like, do you know what I mean? Like they have to sell you living in it. They and don't. And then it's up to the they new have to owners. They sell it with us living in it though, because let me tell you something. They told us last, what day was that Leah? Friday. They told us last Thursday that they were selling the house. We had an inspection for it today in our home. Jesus. They That's are photographing on Monday and having an open house the next Saturday. We wouldn't be able to have moved in that time. So then you're forced to go through this other process of like having the house open and available, you know. Whenever they want to show. That. It's been really shitty, you guys. Let's just put it that way. It's been shitty, shitty, shitty. Uh, they don't have to give you 48 hours notice here. They have to give you 24 they do, hours notice. But they, the second they signed with the real estate agent, they developed an entire schedule and they just posted it on the door. There's nothing you can do about it. So oh, that's so it. different here. They okay. Thursday, the schedule was on the door on Thursday. We had a problem with one of the dates. We weren't being unreasonable, but we had a problem with one of the dates and they refused to move it. Just keep the place messy. Who really cares? That's not part of your lease. You don't live in a messy home is the thing. Oh, make you it know. messy. Have fun. <laughs> our unfortunate truth is that our house looks perfectly styled to sell it. So. <laughs> Damn it. Damn your design eye. I know. Walk around scratching and talk about how it's infested with bed bugs. Oh, that's good. No, just bring a mouse trap, an empty mouse trap. Just put mice trap, mouse traps all over the place and see what happens. Doesn't have to be any mice. Okay, that's so smart. Strategically and that's fucking awesome. I already got rid of the fly traps. I'm sorry. Put out pieces of cheese instead. <laughs> Put on a big mouse trap, like as a dog. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a thing. The problem is that no matter what, it's still going to sell. The market's insane here, um, and they did do some things like they. I mean, this is a joke though, but they did offer it to the renters first. 
So if we had wanted to buy it, it never would have hit the market. They would have just sold it to us at the listing price, um, which was an outrageous listing price. And uh, we're not gonna be able to really stop it at this point. So we just have to be focused on what can we do, how to get out, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. In our landlord's dreamy world, uh, the house would just sell to another person who just wants an investment property and they'll keep both of the tenants. Oh, and the worst part about it is we're not even in the worst position. Our upstairs neighbor is a four generational family. She takes Ugh. care of her invalid, invalid father, her disabled, developmentally disabled son, two other children that are currently homeless right now because they're older children and her grandson. Where are they going to find a four bedroom home in Astoria that's affordable for that? No. Wow. With their psycho dog. Oh, pets. Oh, pets. Oh, it makes me so mad. I'm just working on the lines for my pieces to kind of give them a little bit of definition. And then I'm going to work on to the next subject because I realize it's already 4.38. Um, so when I finish this part out, I'll tell you guys what the next thing is. You don't have to change though. If you work on the, your house idea all night, that's totally fine. I just want to make sure that there's enough subjects that if you feel like that's not working or you don't want to continue working on it, that you can change subjects and try something different. Marcel is doing some really great stuff online and she's doing some great abstract stuff. It's neat to see. Her. I've seen her online stuff. Um, she really has to get her uh, individual voice figured out and I'm excited yeah, to see that. Her around around, but she's, uh, what I think is consistent is she's got a very strong sense of composition, natural. Yep. Which I she love it. Have to think I didn't watch it. Yeah. She's in the kind of the fun phase right now. Personally, yeah. it's a fun phase for me. So true. Well, I think my first one's done. <laughs> and I can imagine similar to what. I like it. She said that it would look very different large. Hey, Krista, can you hold it up in front of your camera that you're- that you I already have... took a picture and put it on the WhatsApp app. There it is. There it is. That looks so fucking cool. I already did it, Leah. It has a very, I kind of wanted to see it just stepping back. Um, but you know what? It's got a very, um, yeah, it's very graffiti-like. Right. I love it. You know what, Christian? On the side, it looks like a boat. Oh, that, Let's see it again. <laughs> that is not surprising. Not surprising. Right. What? I thought. Oh, you know, I know what my problem is. Okay. So, use two more choices. Um, if you get bored with the house thing, one of them, <laughs> two funny, really, really funny inspirations. One of them is a TV and see, I went through and drew some old fashioned TVs last night. There's a, you know, oh, wow. lots of different shapes. 
that would be really fun to pull out and um, use in this kind of example. And then the other option, should TV not be your option? And I'll show you in one second. Give me a moment. It's a hamburger. My dog got this new toy. Isn't this funny? This is how like life works, right? My dog got this new toy and it's a pull apart hamburger, right? And I thought that it would be interesting if you pulled apart a hamburger and kind of use some of the weird shapes that you might, you know, see your lettuce. And the noises that it makes alone are fucking brilliant. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a truly brilliant toy because then my dog is not actually trying to destroy it because every time she pulls it apart, she feels that destruction satisfaction. Right. So if you finish your um, drawing of the deconstructed house, um, feel free to move on to the deconstructed television and or hamburger, whichever you think is more fun. I'm going to start with the television only because I spent some time last night drawing televisions. I don't know why I got on a television thing, but I did. Are you guys watching Hack? at all oh my god i love it so much oh my god no, what is it what is it oh, it's so great what's it about i've never heard of it it's about a comedian a sort of joan rivers type the comedian aging com female comedian played by gene smart uh who gets hooked up with a kind of brilliant but sort of difficult to work with um uh, young writer, young writer in her early twenties. Um, uh, the young writer can't get any jobs, uh, in LA cause she's made some, she did some tweet that was offensive, but also she's just difficult. And Jean Smart is getting kind of railroaded out of her. Is her that job. failing, Kaling? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Redhead kind of irritating now her, what's what's the name gene of the young girl i can't think of her name but she's brilliant she's brilliant they're both and brilliant really irritating i mean gene smart is just fucking brilliant but anyway it's about their very driven difficult fraught uh relationship working together in uh, las vegas of all places <laughs> it's i would highly recommend it it's we so good we are right now are currently terrible and binging Big Brother. Oh, Drag yes, Race All Stars and old CSI as we prepare for the new the old CSI to come back in October and Top Chef because of kind of where we are. That sounds like a good set of things. Uh, we seen Ted Lasso. That's what I've been watching. With oh, I hear that's everybody wonderful. I know is talking about it, and I have not watched it. It's funny. It's yeah. What is that about? It's Jason Sudeikis. I'm not going to say his name. He used to be in SNL, and um, he plays a, a coach, like a football coach in the U.S. who comes oh, yeah. over to the U.K. to play, you know, to coach, you, you know, European football. So. And, and he's so positive. It's, it's actually really funny. It's a good show. Uh, you know who I heard talking about it, ironically, is Lennon Doyle was speaking about it on her podcast and just about the kind of positive nature of it, that it's supposed to be really funny. It, it is. It is. It's, I think season two just started, actually. So that might be why everybody's talking about it, right? I was a Brooklyn, Maybe. I've been a Brooklyn Nine-Nine fan. Um, <laughs> For many years not That's really to be a good show yeah it's i haven't wonderful. seen that yeah it's wonderful it's going into its last season now so we're just watching which is probably good um uh and they're dealing with everything so they're doing a good job and not really because i like andy samberg so much but he's gathered such a brilliant cast around him mm -hmm. 
that it and he supports them so much mm -hmm. like uh people who were he's given people work uh that i think really deserve work and probably wouldn't get it other places like he's really really i think he must be a joy to work with because he's so generous as a performer Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I and he gives everything. All the great lines kind of come to, even though his character has a certain, you know, is kind of the star. Like all the best stuff goes to his cohorts. He's kind of a straight man to his cohorts. That's how it should be sometimes. Though. That's how Absolutely. you like. So. He's very gen he strikes me as generous. When I look at that, that's what I think. I think ah. Oh, this guy is like, yeah, let's showcase her funny. Let's showcase his funny. Let's, uh, I mean, it is a cop show um, at a time when cops are not very popular, although they deal with that. Um, but the cast of characters is amazing, including a bunch of people from the state, a couple of people from the state uh, which was that MTV show in the 90s. You're too young, Nina. You wouldn't remember. You weren't even <laughs> probably. <laughs> Maybe you're Sorry? I wouldn't remember <laughs> what? The state. The state on I don't know what she's talking about. The state of what? That's what I'm talking about. The state on MTV was a comedian. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, a comedian skit show. Um by a bunch of guys, many of whom are working. They all ended up being pretty successful. Ken Marino is one, but they were all just out of college doing these skit shows, doing this sort of skit com comedy show on MTV. Mm -hmm. And it's fucking hilarious. It's always interesting to hear what kind of things people watch, you know? And back in the, yeah, it is true, I agree. It is interesting to hear what people watch oh well, i started binging and i don't think anybody's watching this right now but i started watching murder she wrote <laughs> oh yeah i did what? there's nothing better than that it's so good i didn't she's so like good. a feminist icon from like yeah. the 80s it's like I'm wow Rewatching the classic shows i will tell you though i was super disappointed the one when i i thought well i'm gonna go back and rewatch. um the Wonder Years. Oh yeah, that's kind of a bad show. Kind of a bad show. It's a bad show. <laughs> <laughs> and you know they're remaking it with the black. Oh. And Fred Savage is producing it, and I'm like, like how long um, can you hold on to something in your career? Yeah, and are you the person to be like if it's gonna be the Wonder Years? It's gonna be different. Now. Let's just face it, it's gonna be a different experience for the black family. And is Fred Savage the one? Anyway, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I screwed yeah. mine up, it's totally gross now. Oh, what makes it gross? Let's talk about it, because the hardest well, part about I've never, is I've never done paint over colored pencils and everything just got smeary. Okay, uh, yeah, it got smeary, that's weird. Can you send me a picture of it just so I can see? I just did. Okay. I don't think it looks that bad. I don't think it looks that bad. I think that um, watercolors, you know, they're going to take some of the pigment. I think it's well, okay it's, though. It was acrylic. Oh, wow. I, wanted them to, I wanted it to be sheer. So I put a lot of water. I mixed a lot Got of it. water with it. Um, yeah, it does. It just kind of looks like that. I, I, I see what you're saying. Um, and I feel like it's sad because in that corner there was that tiny little spot where I saw that you had some detail we don't want to lose. I feel like Alice in Wonderland, like I'm falling through the your painting into an Alice <laughs> in Wonderland story. <laughs> and I mean that in a positive way, not in a negative. <laughs> way. Well, I can go back over it once it dries, I guess. Yep, that's that's the best part, right? Yeah, yeah. Once the medium dries, you can redo it what you want with it. You 
uh, have a very cool palette, uh, Nina. You like the cool colors. I do. I'm not someone who likes bright colors. Anyone who knows me knows that. Yeah, I can see that from your. I can see that from all. It's interesting to see you take it in the abstract direction. I can see that your preference is uh, kind of uh, muted, which is wonderful. Lots. Of, I mean, gray is great. It's yeah, and I think honestly, like there's some real um, opportunity when you like that palette, when that is your palette. Because what I would say is somebody who's been known for bright colors my whole career, um, they're risky. You can make a lot of mistakes. You can make things look really terrible by bad choices. Yep. This color palette, what's nice about it is, is you have lots of beautiful opportunities between like blues and grays and greens. And then you can always just throw something wild in there, in there at the very end and just stick to complementary colors in your gold. Like you can make okay. lots of easy choices. Yeah, it's simple yeah. thing. Okay. I wish I did like bright colors more. I, I really do. Wow. Well, I think that you know, you it's been my experience that you should trust your taste and and let that be part of it for you. Yeah. That's you know. I I'm always yeah, love yellow and it's always going to be a part of my practice so why pretend that it's not <laughs> yeah but the pop of color is is always really nice but yeah no everyone's like your stuff is so gray it's so gray and depressing it's like okay i find it cheery but sure <laughs> <laughs> um, I, would again, I, I would call it i would call it dreamy i would dreamy. say i like that better yes <laughs> It's soft so, and dreamy is often gray and indistinct. Uh, Lennon Doyle says that you're, it makes you a midnight person. Mm -hmm. so Probably. She has this whole thing, she has this whole thing on her, her podcast about what happens when you're a kind of person drawn to moodier color schemes. She's got a whole thing that involves all the cultural things that you're involved with. And she compares herself and her, her wife because they're very different. And she says, I'm a midnight person, meaning that's just where she exists. You know? That's what she likes. She likes the soft, hazy colors. Yeah. The, the indistinct. Oh my God. So is Rob. Rob's in the midnight person. I was just understanding that too. You can see that from, you can see that. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Like, uh, I will always say this too, though. Like, you're drawn to things for a reason. They they attach to memories and to sensations. And you know, the best thing you can do then is just stick with what you really are, are passionate about and be as good at it as possible. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's good. Fine, I'm gonna gonna use I mean I'm in the middle of a giant blue project. So what room do I have to talk right now? <laughs> blue is great. Yeah, I'm gonna blame my cat. It was gray and white growing up. So, <laughs> so you're like, uh, what can I say? I'm inspired by my childhood cat. Wouldn't you? Be? My childhood cat. That's it. That's what I'm gonna say. And I'm a midnight person. Project today, but you guys want me to show you what I've been working on? Yeah. 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 It's a little tiny cityscape of Washington D.C. And it's a little oh, wow. tidy, not my normal. Here, let's see. I chose to go with the hamburger option. I'm just going to tell you guys. And at first, I was not Yay, going. Yay, hamburger! Right. Well, at first, I was not going to use colors that are hamburger colors, and then I got to thinking about it in this first iteration because I think I'm going to rework it. I got some ideas on how to rework it. I'm. Uh, I'm just going to go with the uh, hamburger colors because I kind of like it. Excellent. I feel like they're going to be really nice together. At the AGO here in Ontario, they had this massive hamburger that looked like it was stuffed, but it was massive. And I don't know who the artist is, but it's <laughs> it's pretty impressive, right? It, you're not, you know, yeah, you can't touch it or whatever, but it's it's very cool. It and your stuffed um, toy looks exactly kind of like that. See, it's such a silly oh toy. God. Oh my god, yeah, that's beautiful though. Um, I'm sure that you're going to develop some kind of color on top of that giant yellow oh wow center 
Yeah, that is, if I showed you the picture, you'd see this is exactly how the monument is lit. Is lit. But I know I need to see it here. I'll show you up here. This is the photo source. Well, I can show you also here, just take a picture of it. Um, but I loved how the sky looked and how the ground kind of. Yeah, no, totally. Um, and that pink spot or. Yeah. You know, you know, like that's just such a beautiful development of the sky there. Nina, yours looks like a Japanese garden. Oh, thanks. That was actually one of the wineries in Jordan Valley, which is by Niagara on the Lake. Oh, how nice. Wow. Yeah. Why is it like that? Leah, I love yours too. Oh my God. That's yeah, the gorgeous. sky is beautiful. I just sent a thing of the hamburger. Oh, what somebody I knew took that photo. She was watching. Oh my gosh, wow. Okay. So you see what I'm working with. Um, it's going to be. Oh, I'm dying over the floor burger. The oh my burger is so nice. Yeah. You, 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 you would love this hamburger, I think. Oh, <laughs> what is it made out of? Cardboard boxes painted with acrylic. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. okay. Oh, wow. Plays older bird. Yes. Oh my gosh, it's cracking me up. Oh, oh do you, have you heard of them, Leah? Or yes. anyone? I have. Okay. Oh um, my God. That's so awesome. We have a little peninsula. So technically, I live on the border of Washington and uh, Oregon. And we have a little peninsula. Hold on. I'm going to find the. And the peninsula was known for having. The United States' largest frying pan oh. has been used. So hold on. Oh, it's the world's largest frying pan. Sorry, world's largest frying pan. And it's actually been used. Um, I'm trying to find a good photo for you guys. <laughs> but it's hilarious to me. Uh, we used to drive by it all the time. And I saw actual photos of it um, being used. This poor person is about to become part of somebody else's screenshot. <laughs> I think I think Audrey's laughing. Mm. Okay, here we go. Let me add it. And let me add it for y'all. Here's the world's largest frying pan in Long Beach, uh, Washington. Let's see. Did they cook in it? They did. So oh, on the wow. Long Beach, so on the Long Beach Peninsula, one of the things that it, they are known for is their clams. So they have a clam festival, the Razor Clam Festival. And uh, you can always dig razor clams and then they, everybody makes them. So they did razor clams in them one time. In that pan? In that pan. Did they take it down and? It wasn't there at that time because it was like 20 years ago. It wasn't recently. <laughs> That's wow. So it's very strange to me, like cultural symbols like that. The... Peninsula had a couple weird things. <laughs> One of them was Jake the Alligator Man. So they've got this weird little gift shop that's also in theory some kind of <coughs> museum. And it's got all like all the weird circus games and stuff. You know, like you used to like hold your hand on the crystal ball and it would tell you your your uh, fortune. The eight, the eight ball? Yeah, and like just all the weird mechanical ones. It used to be that they were five cents and ten cents, and they would like how hard you held it told you what kind of person you were and that kind of thing. So they have, I mean, 150 of these kind of games in this museum thing, and they've kept a bunch of weird, all kinds of weird stuff that kind of goes in conjunction with it. And one of them is a metal sculpture of a tiny little alligator man. And it's not real, clearly. Um, and but they have stickers made. Everybody has Jake the Alligator Man stickers on their car up on the peninsula. I love that. It's the weirdest thing. I will show you guys. 
It's not preserved. It is made out of metal. It is fake. Audrey says it's real and she's full of poo. I'm going to send you guys the photos, though. You want to see something weird. I believe you, Audrey. <laughs> Jean believes you. So this is it. I love your, Chris, I love your, your hamburger. It's probably right? That's my hamburger right now. Most of the time. Oh my God. Those are so weird. Right? Uh, and it's in like a glass case in the, fucking oh gosh. gosh. It's in the, no, it's in the uh, museum. Oh, it's in an aquarium, like a glass aquarium. It's like a twist. <laughs> My dog didn't like those people going by, sorry. <laughs> but it's ridiculous, right? Oh, this is my favorite part. They brought it out to the beach. This is the photo that they use to claim that it's real. Oh my God, I can't wait to share this with you guys. This is one of just one of the weird things about living in tiny weird rural places. But Audrey swears it's real. <laughs> I feel like your current painting, Krista, looks like what your floor must look like. <laughs> it's like the dog is apart. taking this shit apart. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's just really fucking weird. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> and they have stickers and stuff you can put on the back of your car, I believe. <laughs> I love it. It's so <laughs> weird. Yeah, I'm going to run and get a, a, just a little more coffee. Um, so I'll be right back. I'm going to mute because I don't trust these people I share a space. <laughs> Is that Lee Krasner I see up next? I don't know where she is. Are you painting in oil, Leah, or is that acrylic? Oil. Okay. It would be the same. It'd look about the same. Yeah. But this is a dope. I tend to work in oil. Except could, yeah. doing certain subjects. Certain subjects I like to do in acrylic because I like to do them fast. My ferns and flowers I like to do in acrylic because they go fast. But my cityscapes, I think I have a better handle on. So uh, I'm happier, I'm just happier working in oil. Yeah. I say 
I, I don't really think that's true. I don't have a handle on them, but right now, but. <laughs> Uh, all right. I'm going to wait to go big on this one. So I think I'm going to work on a composition a little bit more. I was thinking about, sorry, I was getting coffee because if I don't consistently drink uh, liquids, I lose my voice. Um, and I was thinking about um, the way like even with this hamburger thing, it's such a symbol of America. America. Uh, yeah. Like even when I went to Madagascar, they had an American hamburger on the menu at one of the restaurants I went to. This is such a hilarious story. And it was ham. Ham. <laughs> ham. <laughs> a bun with French fries. Yep. On the bun, like in the sandwich. In sandwich. <laughs> That's and funny. And as we're like taking these things apart, these like cultural things we're thinking of like home, even like not thinking about how you guys would, would pull out like animals or like your like other places. Um, it's interesting to think of a deconstructed hamburger, right? Yeah. Um, and how that's like this cultural symbol. And I imagine if it was in the size that uh, Elizabeth Murray works in, it might be a really entertaining piece of artwork. Yes. <laughs> Especially since in my hamburger, it's terrible, like craft refrigerator cheese. Oh. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Cheese flavored mm -hmm. food. Garbage cheese, toxic garbage cheese. So Jean, what did you do to this since you since you showed it to us last? I redrew, I drew on top of all the drawings and tried to make them a little more distinct. Oh, does that feel better to you? No. <laughs> no. Okay. You didn't, you didn't feel like it's a little bit better, but I I don't I like the concept, but I don't like the execution. I like the pair, Nina. Oh, thanks. I like pears. It's uh, it's an interesting thing to what we hold on to, like drawing. Um, like I said, I'm trying to draw more. And I'm not just trying to do the architectural drawing, but I'm also trying to work on just kind of random illustrations, which is why I did that TV illustration last night. And I did it because we were watching TV. Um, I tend to draw coffee cups a lot for stupid reasons. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. if if I start doodling, I'm going to draw coffee cups. Um, and it's, so it's always interesting, the things that we personally choose to doodle. And maybe that's because I was never, I was never a drawer as a kid. You wouldn't have given me a pencil and a piece of paper and had me sit down and create something, you know? Um, which is hilarious that I'm a professional artist, right? Me neither. Was the in the longer art 21 about Elizabeth Murray, she talks about how she always was a drawer, you know? I just- Oh, she was, think, okay. Yeah, she always was a drawer. She's, you know, she, as a child felt like it was um, a thing about her that was really special, um, a skill that she had. And I just, that submission I did was for a chamber music program. And what was impactful about the submission for me was I was, I was a creative child. I did community theater and I did music until my second year of college. Um, visual arts just was never, maybe it's just my mom's not interested in visual arts, you know, and like parents kind of steer their kids towards extracurricular activities. I don't know, but it's interesting that so now I feel like I'm kind of having to make up a whole life of drawing. <laughs> I feel the same way, exactly the same way. I was not one of the, I was not a kid who drew. Mm -hmm. Early I used, I was very big with color. Like I loved to kind of, before drawing was an issue, color mm -hmm. was everything for me. 
And um, yeah, I feel like I have to make up for lost time too. I know what you mean. Um, learning, making sure I sort of push my skills. Yeah, even in college, you know, I went through an art program, but I was only required because I was in the sculpture program to take two drawing classes. One of them was an intro to design class. We did a lot more collage than we did drawing. And the other class, we drew gravestones in the graveyard on campus all summer. Like, it wasn't like now I'm, I'm thinking a lot about storytelling and, and how we we have voices and what those voices you know and and a lot of that seems to me that like drawing will be a better way for me to document the things i care about it's interesting you think your drawing improved because you drew gravestones oh i don't think my drawing improved when i drew gravestones you know when my drawing improved though uh i worked in a bank and it was after I'd started painting and I couldn't bring my painting supplies to my teller window, but I could bring a sketchbook and a pencil. And so I worked then on other kinds of drawing though, not like what I'm working on now. Like I did uh, a lot of like hand lettering and stuff like that. Like I was working on designs for things and stuff. But I know at the time that if I did it every day, like I was, I got significantly better. And then yeah. as soon as I became a professional artist and stopped practicing drawing because I was painting, uh, I went back to the same skill level I was at before. <laughs> I, uh, I, think, um, I think that's one of the reasons I like to teach it because it keeps my hand in mm. things that I would not do normally. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I particularly think I'm a better drawing teacher than a painting teacher because painting comes so naturally it's hard for me to break those skills out but drawing didn't come naturally to me at all so I really had to break it down yeah like into a process that was understandable for me um, so I think teaching it keeps your hand in the game and so practicing or teaching play, and I actually really love drawing now. I think it's a wonderful thing, but it took me a long time to get there. And I really, it was for me, the block, the barrier was really the pencil. I just hated the pencil so much. Pencil I just as a tool, I just didn't appreciate. Why do you think you hated the pencil? Um, because I love the paintbrush so much. I did not like the marks the pencil made. I had no no patience. You know what I mean? Or yeah, like I just had no patience for what the pencil had to offer. <laughs> then I got into watercolor. Now I have way more patience for the for the pencil. But you, the, this, these guys will tell you. I have been known to say I'm really bored by this try, so I'm just gonna stop if I'm teaching with pencil. Because I just get bored with it after a while. I can't. Uh, once I learned how to draw to improve my painting, that became the game changer for me. Then I was like able to go, oh, okay, this is why uh, it's good to use this tool. This is why it's important. All of that. I was, I drew, we, the classes that I took, we drew in chalk mostly yeah i love ch chalk is wonderful oh wow old vine chalk you know the crispy fritters this is interesting i'm gonna i think on this one i'm gonna look, work a little harder on lines and stuff this is kind of a silly little thing to be doing but i'm kind of enjoying the weird weird little hamburger drawing. <laughs> well, we know what patchouli would prefer. Hamburgers all the way. Hamburgers all the way. Give her all the hamburgers. It does make me kind of hungry for hamburgers. <laughs>
some things I'm noticing as I'm reworking some of these designs is that I tend to like to have some of the items, you know, at the top kind of make a focal point towards the top. Um, my architectural drawing class that I'm taking talks a lot about he uses the the thirds method of design. And, you know, where you cut your paper into thirds and you don't want to work in the center. And he uses it to determine where his colors are going to go. And it's an interesting thing that I think about now when I'm doing like this and I'm thinking this like, my instinct is that here somewhere there would be another item and that that would be a color that was accented in some way or noticeable in some way. Um, which in this drawing might be kind of difficult because it's green and orange, right? Most of it or brown, um, but it definitely has, it's something I'm thinking about. Next week, we're gonna do Lee Krasner. Yay. Are there any supplies we should have ready to go for next week? She's pretty much everything that we use today. I'm, um, going to try and really work on things you know things like that the week after we're going to do Eva McGill Oliver and she is uh she uses watercolors primarily um and both Lee's work is more rip style collage and Eva's work is definitely like um cutouts of exact shapes so for Eva's work, you're going to want to bring scissors. You won't need scissors next week for, for Lee's class. Lee's actually one of my favorite artists. I did a, a show with a group of women um, at the Vashon Center for Art, where we each got to pick a different artist from a book. It's, so it's rent day. All of the people in the building are trying to pay their rent. And it happens to be at the mail slot in our studio. My dog uh, is like all the random people coming through. It's all entertainment all the time. By the way, we're at 520, you guys. Yes. So about 10 more minutes. Not to be the time Nazi. But somebody has to pay attention to time here. I know it's very difficult <laughs> when you're painting. Yeah. And my body is telling me what time it is. It's like, honey, you need to go eat. Because you know what Tuesdays normally are. Tuesdays are normally Peter Pan Day. We have a market. We have sandwiches at Peter Pan. I don't know what we're gonna do tonight. And we might be doing that, she says. Um in the area that I live in, one of the things that has happened with the pandemic, and I don't know, Jeannie, if you guys are experiencing this where you live, in the neighborhoods that you live, or Nina even, you guys have completely different rules right now, so it's a little more confusing for me, but um, a lot of our small businesses can't get enough staff, and actually in our story, we're having a problem getting food. So they oh. have to have additional days that they're closed more than normal. Um, right. We're getting dinner, that we don't make because on Tuesdays, I normally work in the food cart and then I do this. And by the time I get home, I'm not making no. dinner. No. <laughs> um, uh, there's nobody really open. Yeah. Oh, wow. So a lot of the places even have done things like where they've been taking breaks. Like we just got news that um, the, one of the primary breakfast places on the weekend is taking a week long break. They're giving the bistro? their- Huh? The bistro? Uh, nope. The bistro has been open the whole time. The owner of the bistro is super money grubby. So <laughs> but, but I, will say, I will say though, he works in his restaurant and he works there all of the time and he does all of the spots. So there's a protest at Carruthers tonight. What for? 
Are they because they're closed? Oh, okay. So here's some local drama. Uh, there's a protest at one of the restaurants Carruthers tonight because they're requiring vaccination cards. They're requiring vaccination cards in case you needed to know because the manager of the restaurant who was fully vaccinated got COVID through her vaccination because of unvaccinated individuals and is in her third week of having it. She's in her second full round of it and they're looking at hospitalizing her. That's and she's vaccinated. Wrong. So Fuck those fuckers. Sorry, that's on the video. But you know what? All you ask the anti-vaxxers, fuck you. Did <laughs> you hear that, anti-vaxxers? Anti-vaxxers and mask and mask holes. Yeah. Fuck you. <laughs> I didn't have a whole protest tonight, but that's interesting. Oh wow. Are they open right now? Are they open Good for them. Oh my god, they people would be going crazy in Portland. Every bar is making you provide your vaccination card well we live in rural oregon where old douchey white guys still really try to push their ideals on everyone mm -hmm. yeah yep old douchey sorry to go off on this on this video this is not what we're doing no uh, no we're doing art but right here with you we're just doing hamburger hamburger drawing burgers <laughs> yeah and chris yeah. Is to go get a hamburger somewhere <laughs> uh, apparently i'm getting a sandwich there's no hamburger at peter pan yeah I think there is a shortage of supplies. I mean, everywhere you go here, they, there's help wanted signs for anybody in the service industry here. Yeah. We have a, quite a few problems that are participating in the service industry um, issues. One is that Astoria has had the highest number of tourists this season that we've ever had, meaning that they need more staff. A bunch of staff people in the service industry, when they all closed, went into other industries because they still needed an income and they're not coming back to the service industry. A lot of those service members have children who are not in school or can, they can't get childcare for. So they have to stay a job right now. And yeah. we don't have housing for people who make minimum wage with tips. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. So where are the servers going to come from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Little Miss five hundred thousand dollar home is not going to just decide to go down to the brew pub and work. Right. Yeah. So that's it is. Are there been, government subsidies though? Have there been subsidies for there's people? Been couple, here? There's been a couple of checks. Um, there was a lot of funding for small businesses yep. that was tied to a lot of weird things. One of the problems that we're having is that small business owners like me, I'm a professional artist, I file taxes for, as a small business, um, could qualify for the pandemic un unemployment assistance, but it ends this week. Yeah, so people are freaking out about that. People are freaking I, out about that. Regular unemployment, you're, if you, like my boyfriend is a stagehand in a union, so he's always on unemployment. So when he doesn't work, he doesn't collect it all the time, but he has the option because his his work is con consistently temporary. Um, but if you are self-employed, then it's a very limited thing. Now they're kind of trying to push the self-employed people into loans. Like, loans or crazy. Oh, they want them to go into the service industry. You know, yeah. What you're yeah, they were, yeah, yeah, exactly. What you're supposed to do, you know, is give up this career and this business that you've been building for however long. Right. And, and go, go wait tables. Or yeah. try to do it both. I mean, yeah, with a bunch of assholes who won't vaccinate. Yeah. Fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. It's tricky. I yeah. just hope this thing ends. I honestly I just want COVID gone. Well, but it can't. It's not going to go away. I know it's not going to go away. Are yeah. masking and vaccinating because it, it's still spreading, and then and there's a new variant coming along that's developed out of Delta. So, is that the Lambda I, one that they're talking about? I, don't, I heard there's a new one now. So Lambda, okay. they one called come. Lambda. Um, but, yeah, it just keeps sure. going on. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what that, that's what viruses do. That's the reason that they were so freaked out in the beginning. That's the reason that they tried to sh shut us down the way that they did. I mean, let's talk about New Zealand. Here's an interesting thing about New Zealand, you know, so they do a hard shut, a level mm -hmm. four shutdown whenever one case is found on the island. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're in day 14 
they found one case and it was Delta. It came from a traveler mm -hmm. and they found three people connected to it that got Delta. They are only at 50% vaccination there because they, they had late access in comparison to the United States and to Canada. Mm -hmm. um, but they have the ability in between finding one or two um, versions that only come from travelers because they've isolated through the whole country. They don't have the problems that we're having with individualism and protesting and things like that. Um, they've actually been shown some really funny memes about Americans that post on Instagram posts and things like that for people in New Zealand about them needing freedom. And the New Zealanders are like, nah, dude, you've been wearing a mask for the last year and a half. We haven't. Yeah. So like, your system doesn't work. You're just- Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Well, I think they're running out of oxygen tanks in certain states in the U.S. Right. And, and they're doing, and they're doing uh, water shortages because they use water to produce the liquid oxygen that they're giving people. Uh -huh, so like in really? Florida, they're doing water shortages, not because there's a drought, but because they need the, the liquid oxygen for also one of the people in the hospital. Uh, wow. Is that if you have something happening to you that's not COVID, you can't get a hospital bed right now. Oh. So say you have a heart attack, you're going to do an ambulance tour trying, like in Portland, where you're going from hospital to hospital trying to find a bed because all of the surgical wings and all of the emergency wings are taken over by COVID. So then what happens is if you don't have COVID and you end up in the ER, you're likely to get COVID on your way out. So. Well, India went through this, right? Earlier in the year, right? When they had- Yeah, we went through that at the beginning. Yeah, they went through that earlier. Yeah, it was very bad um, with yeah. oxygen yeah. and people were then selling fake oxygen tanks, right? Or, yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's horrible. Is bad. We have a bunch of people from India. I, I wish you could meet them, Krista. Someday I hope you will. All the, our European and India contingents, and they were besides themselves. And one of them got COVID. Her whole family got it. Oh, you know, it was bad. It was, everybody seems to be okay, though. Although I haven't seen her in class for a while, so I should double check, I'll make sure she's okay. But she seemed to be getting better um that's really cute oh my god sorry yeah, i love it Beta. i love that hamburger <laughs> isn't it silly it's so funny. My cheese. that my cheese, cheese the cheese doesn't look enough. fake enough the cheese doesn't look I know. Fake well, don't worry i got this this layer of cheese topping <laughs> cheese topping the yellow get, get in the right color oh. um you know, it's a really hard time. We actually, you know, we're going to see some really hard things for people to go through to see. Yeah. They're going to see things like, you know, fake oxygen. We're going to see just how much people with money have access to life changing and saving things. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we haven't even talked about like what's going on in New Orleans right now. Right. Yeah, it's really fucking terrible. They're going to be without well, power for three weeks. Three weeks. Why? Wow. What happened? Five in a global pandemic they yeah. had a hurricane ida oh sorry i have not been watching the news i'm like on half <laughs> vacation i just shut out the world sorry that's smart oh, that's smart God. now you're like i'm gonna go back on vacation <laughs> if you can afford to it's great if you're part of that situation shit i lost my electricity for 30 hours and i thought i was going to lose my fucking mind i was one of those people who was like i'll just be hardy and go out there and instead <laughs> i just i just it was 30, we had, we were piled with snow outside. It was, and I just curled up in a blanket in front of our, <laughs> in front of our, our fireplace and ate cheese. <laughs> I was like, that's all I fucking did. I couldn't do anything else. I'm like, I am the first one to go when it goes down. <laughs> I need cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Just useless. Eating cheese. That's so funny. 
I love <laughs> it. I work like morning to night. I'm like busy. I never stop working. Like literally never stop working. But <laughs> take away my electricity and I just crumble. Curled up in a little ball. <laughs> Don't take away the cheese. That's all. Right. Yeah. Now, the problem is, you know, your refrigerator goes out and then like you're like, you gotta eat the food fast. You gotta eat yeah. the cheese because like it's going. <laughs> That's really funny. Oh, and it was okay, so cool. Well, it's 5.30. Uh, I hope you guys can <laughs> got something out of this class more than um, about COVID. Although, let's be real, a big part of art is processing what's happening in real world time. Right. Um, and, and I have something I can tear up and put in a collage. A hundred percent. Okay, that's great. Yeah. So... And I'm going to keep working on my hamburger. I'm going to have the perfect hamburger composition. You watch. Send it, yeah, send it to us. Yes. Yeah. That looks good. It's, it's cheese. The cheese is looking a little bit better. The cheese but. is looking better. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, it's been wonderful. Everybody have a great day. Have a great day. Bye. 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 Yeah.